Welcome to part two of uh, Vectors and Equilibrium. Let's start uh, our topic with uh, torque. So what is uh, this uh, torque? A physical quantity that will give rise to your angular acceleration, a quantity like that is defined as torque. So if you look at this diagram over here, suppose you have a wrench and you were to unscrew this bolt over here. So you put the wrench on this bolt like this as shown and you apply a force say in this direction. So the distance from the line of action of your force to the center of the bolt is your distance R and only uh, for the torque the only component that is going to contribute from force is the F sine of phi where phi is the angle between the force and the direction from this wrench. The x axis, the normal. Hence, torque is a vector quantity and it is represented with the symbol tau and it is the uh, vector product of R and F. So it's R cross F, which gives you RF sine of phi and n hat because, of course, the torque is a vector quantity. And so the units for torque are Newton meters. Now let's talk about some of the factors that would affect the torque and hence the angular acceleration that this torque would produce. So the first one we have the magnitude of your force, which means that the strength of the force is going to affect the angular acceleration that is going to be produced. Which is obvious because uh, say you apply more force, your strength is higher and you basically push something with that force, you're going to produce more the angular acceleration, right? So you're going to cause more rotation in that system. Next, you have the distance that is between your line of action of this force that you're applying and the pivoting point. So to explain that, let's go back to this diagram and imagine if you were applying a force in this direction on this wrench. It would be much more easier to move or rotate the wrench. But what if you were applying the force instead in this direction? By this direction, I just mean uh, at this point here. So you, you know from even from your everyday experience, your intuition even tells you that it would be harder to rotate this wrench by applying a force here, which means that the closer that you are to this pivoting point, the harder it is to produce any angular acceleration, hence any rotation is uh, harder to produce by applying a force closer to this pivoting point. While if your force was applied over here, as it is shown in this figure, it is easier to rotate this wrench and hence unscrew the bolt over here. And finally, we have the value of this sine theta. How would this affect uh, your torque? So it would be a nice exercise to play around with this angle theta and put values in sine and see yourself how would this thing affect your torque or the angular acceleration that is going to be produced. Next, let's talk about something that is called a couple. And it is almost exactly what you have in your mind right now by hearing uh, this word couple. So if you look at this diagram over here, you see that you have two forces, two force vectors like this, and you can immediately see that these two force vectors are opposite in directions. But what you might not be uh, able to see from this figure is that these two forces are also equal in their magnitude. So the strength of the forces are the same. So a couple basically means that you have two forces that are exactly the same in the magnitude, but they point in opposite directions. And so on a, if these forces were to be acting on a body, they would be constituting to a couple. 
So a couple is basically when you have two equal but opposite forces that are acting on a body. Now let's talk about equilibrium state. So say that you have a body and it keeps its uh, state of rest or uniform motion remains invariant under many forces acting on this body. This bo the body is said to be in a perfect equilibrium. Now equilibrium itself comes in a group of two. First we have static equilibrium which essentially just means that the acceleration vector is zero and even the velocity vector is zero. So something is completely, it is static, right? So we ha it's not moving at all. So its velocity is zero and even the acceleration is zero. So it's neither accelerating and nor is it even moving at all, right? Then we have dynamic equilibrium where yes it is not accelerating at all so it's said to be in an equilibrium but it is moving right so velocity is not zero so it can be moving but it's not accelerating so acceleration vector is zero so hence we term this thing as dynamic equilibrium moving forward let's uh, m move our attention towards some of the conditions for equilibriums so the first condition is that the sum of all of your forces that are acting on a body sums to zero. So the sum of all of these forces essentially vanishes. Which also means that the coplanar forces sum should also vanish. So the x component of all these forces should be equal to zero while the y component of all of these forces should also be zero. So this first equilibrium the first condition for this equilibrium implies a translational equilibrium state so for example let's consider this system where you have a body that is uh, this o and it is under the action of external forces as you can see so you have this 10 newtons 5 newtons 5 newtons downward and 7 newtons 5 newtons to the left and to the right you have three forces 3 5 and 4 newtons now, let's uh, define our coordinate system in this way that all the forces that are pointing upwards are positive and all the forces that are pointing downwards are negative. And similarly, for the horizontal, let's say that all the forces pointing to the right are positive and all the forces that are pointing to the left are negative. And so we are doing this because we know that force is a vector quantity, right? So now let's uh, compute the sum of all of the forces uh, in x direction. So we would have 5 newtons from here, plus 3 newtons from here, and plus 4 newtons from here, because these are all to the right and all forces to the right are plus. And then we would have minus 7 newtons from here and we would have minus 5 newtons from here and hence this expression 5 plus 3 plus 4 minus 7 minus 5 and this sum evaluates to simply 0. So the sum of the forces in the x direction are 0. So it vanishes. So we have checked for this example that some of the forces uh, if for x direction are indeed zero. What about some of the forces in y direction? So if you look at this figure we have in the upwards y we have 10 newtons and then there is nothing over there but if you look at downwards we have 5 newtons and 5 newtons acting to the down and according to our convention that we have chosen over here we would have plus 10 minus 5 minus 5 newtons which evaluates to zero newtons and hence we can say according to these two conditions as they have been as they have been fulfilled f y and f x sum of these forces is zero and hence the translational equilibrium is maintained in this diagram now let's talk about the second condition for equilibrium state which is that the sum of the torques all of the torques that are acting on a body about the same axis 
of rotation is equal to zero. So that sum should also vanish. You can also state this thing as the sum of all your anti-clockwise torques is equal to the sum of all the clockwise torques. So a system that fulfills this second condition of uh, the sum of torques is equal to zero, this second condition of equilibrium is said to be in a rotational equilibrium state. So for example, consider this diagram, this system, where we have a body with an axis of rotation about this point O, and it's under an action of external torques, as you can see over here, right? So now let's define this uh, coordinate system. Let's say that the clockwise torque is negative, and let's say the anti-clockwise torque is positive. So we can do that. We could have even taken this thing uh, as uh, negative and we could have taken this thing as positive. But once you choose your system, right, uh, you work entirely in that system. So the clockwise torque on this system is 10 newtons and uh, 2 meters. So if you take the product of these two, 10 times 2, you get... 20 newton meters but then because we defined our clockwise as negative we added this negative sign and hence we get a negative sign so we have negative 20 newton meters as the clockwise torque for this system and the anti-clockwise torque it is defined as positive so we have positive 10 newtons times 2 meters which is 20 newton meters and now if I were to compute to check if it is in equilibrium, let's compute the sum of all the external torques for this system. So we have plus 20 Newton meters that comes from the anti-clockwise torque and we have minus 20 Newton meters that comes from the clockwise torque and the sum of these is just zero, right? And hence we can say that the body or our system is in a state of rotational equilibrium. Now just a note over here that if the system is in translational and rotational equilibrium, so both the equilibrium states are maintained, then the system is said to be in a state of a complete equilibrium. Now finally, let's give our two cents on center of gravity. So the center of gravity of your body is where the entire weight of your system or the body is concentrated at. And so every body or a system will have a center of gravity, which is irrespective of the shape of your system. And last but not the least, it is not always true that the center of gravity will lie within the body. It can obviously be situated outside of the body. For example, if you consider a ring, then the center of gravity of a ring is situated in its center, but there is no uh, thing, no such ring, right? So there's no material of the ring at that center. So uh, the center of gravity of a ring, it lies in space, right? And let's look at some of the shapes of the... Uh, of some objects right and let's see figure out where their center of gravity lies so we have uh, a cylinder first of all and you can see that the center of gravity for this cylinder it lies on this axis of this cylinder right so it lies over here and for a triangle you can see that the center of gravity of this triangle it lies at the point of intersection of all of its medians right as you can see and the center of gravity is over here likewise for a circle if you consider a circle it lies exactly at the center of the circle so the center of gravity for a circle is exactly at this point which is the center of the circle and now if you consider a square right so the, for a square the center of gravity it lies at the intersection of its diagonals so the center of gravity is at this point and finally if you look at this shape which is of a rectangle right the center of gravity of this rectangle it also lies at the intersection of its diagonals which is over here so with this we'll conclude the chapter number two for NET physics which was of vectors and equilibrium